The first thing um, that you have to keep in mind when we are using Google Classroom, I don't know how many of you um, were also in the G Suite introduction training we did last week, or I think two weeks ago, but the first thing you have to understand when we are referring to um, using Google Classroom is the fact that everything is connected. So some of you might have already seen this slide, but I think it's an important thing that we talk through this before we just dive into Google Classroom. Essentially, when we break it down, what we want to be able to do is we want to get our content, which might either be on your laptop, it might be on a desktop, it might be on a mobile device. We want to get that content to the learners, whether it's in our classroom, whether it's them in front of a computer, maybe in a computer lab, maybe they're fortunate to have such a device at home, or very importantly, on a mobile device. This is, the, this is the end goal. We want to get our content to our learners. And in doing so, there are many different platforms that you might have used, many different platforms you might have considered using. Um, today, we're going to look at how Google Classroom can bridge that gap for us. How Google Classroom is essentially going to be the tool we use to connect to our learners. Now, first and foremost, before you can do anything on Google, you must have a Google account. We're going to talk a little bit more about the Google account in a minute as well. But first and foremost, you must have a Google account. The Google account allows you to sync across multiple devices. And essentially, this gives you access to a very important part of Google, and that is Google Drive. Now, today's session is not about Google Drive. However, if you are not familiar with Google Drive yet, I really recommend that you um, that, that you get, that you basically go through a few more courses to get familiar with this. There's lots of resources on using Google Drive on our, develop, on our um, site as well, so please go have a look at those things. Because essentially, this gives us access to our Google, um, to our G Suite apps. This includes Google Docs, Google Slides, Google Sheets, um, all of the different Google elements. Google Draw is another one I know some people uh, like to use. And all of that eventually leads us to Google Classroom. Now, in order to understand Google Classroom a little bit better, I'd like to take a step back and just explain how Google Classroom even came into being. Now, a few years ago, this is about five or six years ago, um, some, teachers were, some teachers were very much using Google Drive to connect to their learners. So they were setting up folders, um, in Google Drive, they were creating a lot of resources in Google Drive, wanting to share it with their learners. Because ultimately, the goal is to get our content from our devices to our learners. So they did that without using Google Classroom, because it didn't exist. However, that was a lot of effort, because now you had to go and set permissions for all your files, et cetera, et cetera. And it really becomes quite a hassle. Now, what Google Classroom was originally, it was basically the bridge between Google Drive and the learners. That's all that it really was. And if you really go and break it down, pretty much all that it still is, is it, it acts as the bridge between Google Drive and the learners. Now, um, for that reason, this is why I say it is incredibly important that you actually understand how Google Drive works if you really want to get the most out of Google Classroom. When you look at the arrows that I've drawn here, very importantly, it's a two-way thing when we use Google Classroom. Because what Google Classroom does, um, in essence, if we go into Google Classroom, it is the distribution and collection platform of digital content. Now, I think a lot of times we forget about this part. Because distribution is sometimes not the most challenging thing to do. If you've got a WhatsApp group, and you've got all your learners in your WhatsApp group, if you post a link on it, they get it, and you've distributed content. It's not easy to go back and find it, et cetera. That's true, but, it's, but you can get it to them. What becomes difficult is getting content from them to you, because now it becomes, a, it's just as I don't even want to go there, but it becomes difficult. Um, but essentially what happens is Google Classroom will act as the bridge between the teacher and the learners. You can add content, assignments with integrated rubrics, quizzes that collect learner progress, etc. Today, we're not going to get to the more complicated parts because I really want to focus on just 
um, the basics of getting your classroom set up, getting your learners on there, and getting some content on it. Because I promise you, once you get going with Google Classroom, um, you will start discovering the little elements there are to it. We've also got another video where we do a deep dive into Classroom that will cover some of the more complicated aspects of Google Classroom as well. But, and this is, an, this is a very significant point that a lot of people unfortunately skim over a little bit. If you want to get the most out of Google Classroom, you have to understand the whole G Suite package. It works if you're going to upload Word documents and PowerPoints and PDFs, etc. If you're going to do that, it does work, but it works a whole lot better if you start using the whole G Suite package. That's, that's one of the key things I, I hope that you can take out of this. Um, so when we talk about the G Suite package, just so, so that there's a clear understanding of what's happening here, the G Suite account versus a standard Google account. Now, the nice thing about Google Classroom and pretty much the entire G Suite package is you actually can get, sorry, you can actually get all of it on just a normal Gmail account. So you have access to Classroom, you have access to Docs, to Drive, all of those things. There are limitations, of course. Um, so you will be limited in terms of space, but 15 gigs is quite a lot of space. That's what you get on the Gmail account. The G Suite account has unlimited Google Drive space, which is quite a nice feature to have. Um, and just very, very simply to understand the difference between the two, G Suite means it's an at your school so whatever your school's name is, and a normal one is a Gmail account. I think it's just important to make this distinction because as we go through Google Classroom, I am going to refer to the G Suite functionality versus the Gmail functionality. But again, the great thing is you can use the entire thing with a Gmail account. There are small um, features that are not available, but you can still use it. With regards to this um, this account, the getting a, a G Suite account, it is it is free. Any school can register to get a G Suite account. So. Um, all that you need to have is you must have a domain. The domain is unfortunately not free, but if your school has a website, for example, then you can actually register your school for a G Suite account. Um, if you are interested in that, please, you're welcome to contact me after the session, and I can give you, point you in the right direction how you can start with that. Right, so just so we so that we are clear on those things when we start looking at the um, at Google Classroom specifically. So. Um, now we're going to go straight into Google Classroom and how we actually get to Google Classroom. So if you open a new tab in Google Chrome, and Google Classroom does work in other browsers, but as we have pointed out, Google likes to have a contained unit in the sense that it will play nice with others, but it plays better with itself. Using Chrome is going to work better when you want to use Google Classroom. Now. To get to Google Classroom, there are different ways that you can get it. If you just simply enter Classroom here, you will go to Google Classroom. If you type it at the top in the URL, you'll get to Classroom. But a lot of people like using what we call the waffle over here in the top right corner. If you haven't started using this yet, you need to start getting familiar with the waffle itself. This is basically the way that you get into all the different Google um, into all the different uh, G Suite or Google Apps. Now, if you're on a G Suite account and you click on the waffle, you'll probably find Google Classroom is quite high up in the list. If you're on a normal Gmail account and you click, you will very likely not see Google Classroom there. So what you can do with a waffle is you can rearrange this thing so that it works better for you. So let's say, for example, you scroll down and scroll down. Classroom is, is very often here right at the bottom, as it is here for me. but because I'm on a G Suite for Education one, it is automatically moved to the top. But let's say for argument's sake, I want to move Jamboard a little bit higher. It's a simple case of click and drag, and then move it, and then you move it higher. Now, it's going to take a while to get to the top, so um, you might need to move it one by one like I've done there. So there I've moved Jamboard to the top. Um, Jamboard is quite a cool tool, but we're not going to go into it now. So simple as that, click there, and you'll get, and you can click, and you can go to Google Classroom. Now, um, right, so now my Google Classroom, Google Classroom app is loading. I've already got three classes here. I've got our ICT Champions one and then uh, just two 
um, classes that I use for demonstration. But what, what we want to do now is we want to create our first Google Classroom. So creating a classroom, your first screen will probably look a little bit different from this one. You might have a giant plus button in the middle and not in the top right if you haven't joined classes or haven't um, started classes. One thing that, that, that you also need to take in, into consideration is whether you are a teacher in the class or a learner in the class, you're going to get the content at the same at the same place. So when we start our classroom, we're going to click here, click uh, sorry, click here to create or join a class. Now, whether you, if we click on this plus button, it gives us the option to either create a class or to join the class. Now, when we want to create the class, obviously in this instance, we first want to create a class. Your learners will go through the join class. Um, option. So we're going to click create class and it brings us to this dialog where we have to fill in a number of options when we're creating a class. The only one that is actually required here is the class name. The others are all options that you can use if you want to include it. It really depends on how you're going to use it. Get used to a kind of naming convention that makes sense to you and also consider the fact that quite possibly there will be five or six different teachers or hopefully if in all honesty, there will be all the teachers in school are using something like Google Classroom. So you can't necessarily just call your cl your classroom your name or something in those lines. So think about how you want to name it. In this instance, it's quite easy. I'm going to name, I'm just going to um, call this one the example classroom. So if you want to, you can fill in a section. So let's say this is now the 11A group. And we're going to say the subject is English. And I'm just going to leave the room because, or let's make the room virtual. All right, so there we create our classroom. Now it's going to go through the process. What's actually happening now in the background, what we don't see, as I said, it's a link to Google Drive. So there's a whole bunch of folders that are now being created on Google Drive with certain permissions that are being set up, etc. So that I don't have to go and do it myself. Once I've got my first Google Classroom created, here we go. It's called Example Classroom 11A, and everything is in there. Now, if you're going to create a classroom using a G Suite, you'll see there's an automatic Meet link. So you can automatically create a Meet um, session with your learners, which is exactly what we are doing now, if you want to use that to create um, your meeting. If I'm going to be honest, I'm not a fan of using it this way. I will rather go, and we're going to look at the calendar as well, I rather like to do it through the calendar because this is a there are some issues with this in my opinions so I don't recommend doing it like this now when I've set up my classroom we all everyone um, likes to kind of personalize their thing a little bit you've got either the option of selecting a theme or uploading a photo now all that you can actually set is just this background here um, this backdrop there so if we're going to select the theme they've got a few generic themes that they've already got here which for the most part, work quite nicely. Um, let's say English and history. We're going to see what they've got for us here. We're going to select this one. And all that it does is it changes the this background. There's nothing more that we can set in terms of the display of my classroom. OK, so when the first thing we want to be able to do on this thing is just simply use it as a communication platform. Now, in terms of communicating, before we can communicate with anyone, they need to join our classroom. So that whole process is often what I found the, the part that takes a little bit more or that, that can be a little bit challenging, especially if the learners are not quite used to uh, any using a digital platform yet, getting them to join this classroom. Now, remember, learners who use Gmail accounts can also join classrooms. And if you're using a Gmail account to create your classroom, they will be the ones who can join your classroom. The, when, one of the advantages of being on a G Suite account is typically what one does then is you create a, an account for all the users and you can have a more closed environment. In other words, let's say we've got a school, let's just call it School A. Now, I've got my account, teacher at schoola.com. And the learner has his account, learner at schoola.com. The only one who can join my classes are learners from school A. I can block it and I can limit it. So this creates a more a safer, closed environment. It's one of the advantage, advantages that we have. Um, 
if you've got an account like that, you can change a setting that allows Gmail accounts to join your classrooms as well. So if you've got a school account and you're not going to, um, and you're not actually going to be, um, you, you're struggling to create learner accounts, you can change it so that they can use their Gmail accounts to jump on. Now, when we want to have learners joining our classroom, the easiest way to do it. Now, the one way to do it is if you click on people, I'll show you who's in my classroom. I've only got myself as a teacher and I've got no students yet. So we can go and invite students and add them manually one by one if you wanted to do that. So let's say, for example, I'm going to, right, so there I'm going to add my, my Gmail account. I'm going to invite it and that account has now been invited to my classroom. You'll see it's, it's, it's grayed out because it, um, this person hasn't joined my classroom yet. Right, so they will then receive an email that allows them to join. However, a much, much easier way I've always found is if we go back to our classroom, you'll see it says class code over there. And if you are physically in your classroom, what's quite nice is you can just click on this display icon and it shows it up um, it, it displays it for all to see. It's very easy to, to add. So what I want you to try and do now, I'm going to give you a second or two to try and join my classroom. So in order to join my classroom, um, I'm going to just quickly give you a link. Right, so if you click on the link that I've posted in the, in the chat, it'll take you to Google Classroom. And from there, you can then click on join, or if you click on the plus button, just to show you again, if we click on the plus button, you are, are given the option to join the classroom. Just take note, if you're gonna click on the link, it'll open a new tab. So all that you will have to do is then click on this tab again to come back to our meeting so that you don't miss out on the meeting. So see if you can join this classroom by using the code that I've given you, not creating one, joining my classroom. Right, I'm going to leave it on the people tab to see if, if, if some of you are jumping into my classroom yet. Right, so there we go. There the students are joining. I've got Wesley, Christelle, Volna, Stefani, Jason have all started joining my classroom. So, as you can see, it is very quick and very easy to join a classroom, right? We've looked at it straightforward to set it up, but the process of joining it, if, if you don't have a Gmail account, is a bit more of a, is, is definitely a little bit more tricky, okay? Um, what I'm also going to show you in a minute is what it looks like on a, on a mobile device, because what we found so far is the majority of our learners who are connecting with digital content are doing it using a mobile device. And in that, I think Google Classroom works very, very well. It's got a very good, straightforward and easy um, interface and, this, and system to work by to, to, in fact, get things done. Right, so I'm just going to give you a minute or two to join the class if you, if you aren't. Hello, Yaku. Can you send the code again, please? Yes, I'll send the code again. Right, there's the code. Okay, Charlotte, I'll send the register as well. Right, so... Okay, I'm not going to... We need, we need to move on now. So if you haven't joined the classroom, it's not the, it's, it's not the, it's not an essential part of this. I just wanted to show you how straightforward it is actually to join the classroom. Um, so right, let's jump back to the presentation now. So if you're still on the, the tab where you're trying to join the classroom, rather jump back to the presentation. 
um, because I want to show you a few key things that you need to need to look at when you're setting up your classroom. So first off, when we have created our classroom, we've got a few students in our classroom now. Um, we'll see over here, there are 16 students who have already joined the classroom. Um, so now we need to be now we need to consider when we're going to start adding content they've joined the classroom so we want to possibly restrict the access a little bit especially in the stream now if you go to if you are on your classroom you'll see in the top um in the top right just next to the waffle you've got a gear icon which will take you to the settings now the gear icon just for future reference a very useful thing whenever you're in a google app the gear icon will take you into the settings so that you can go and, and fix a few things. One of the things I want to show you that you need to take note of, the class code. Remember, if you've left a classroom open, which is essentially what this one is now, anyone who has the code can join my classroom, which can be, um, which could potentially be a problem because you have people who could be sitting there saying join classroom and then entering random, um, random letters until they find something that works. Um, so it is a good idea if you're using a Gmail account and you're doing this, once you've got your students in, you can click here and you can disable the class code, which means that people will not be able to join your classroom anymore. Or potentially if you realize but people are spreading this class code and they're joining my classroom, who shouldn't be on there, you can reset it. So you can change it to a different class code. Um, we're not going to do either of those things now because I want to allow the opportunity to join later still. But it's, it's, it's something that one has to take note of. Then what you can also look at, when we look at stream, now we'll talk about the difference between stream and classwork next. Stream is essentially your communication channel. So stream would look, is very similar to any social media kind of stream that we have. New messages on the top and then people can reply to whatever's in there. Now, Sometimes we don't want the students to necessarily be able to post new content. It really depends on how you use your classroom. But I think a lot of teachers prefer to have the option of students can only comment. So they can't post anything new, but if you have posted something, they can reply to it. This is very often a, a pretty default and good setting to have, but it does mean that the students can't use this stream to start a new conversation about something what what i what i often or what i suggest with regard to this possibly start off with your setting like this and then as learners become more familiar with the platform then you might be able to open it up to post and comment um, remember you can change it anytime if you realize things are going haywire learners are really abusing the system they're just um, posting memes and all sorts of things like that. We don't want that to happen. You can turn it off to only teachers can post or comment, where you restrict a lot of this, um, a lot of the access to the classroom in that sense. Then we're going to leave it open because I want to allow you, if you've joined my classroom, you're more than welcome to go to the stream and comment. And just remember everything that you are going to say is going to be part of this recording. So please keep it PC. Then classwork on the stream. Classwork is the second tab that we're going to talk about now. Sometimes we want to be able to, to add the whole classwork in, uh, information. Other times we want to just simply show attachments and details. When I like to use classrooms, I often either have the show condensed notifications or quite often just prefer to completely turn off this or turn this off. And I'll show you how that works or what that means in a minute. So for now, we're just going to say show condensed notifications. Show deleted items, there's really very seldom a reason why you're going to turn this on and off, or you will probably just leave this one off for the most part. So if you want to turn it on, please note it means only teachers can view the deleted items. So you, if, if you deleted something by accident, you can go back and you can um, still view that if you wanted to, but it's going to clutter your stream for the most part. Then, um, of course, we've got the meet. Which you, can, which you can use if you're on a G Suite. If you're not on a G Suite, this is not available. Then they've got, I think, I'm not 100% correct, but they might have changed this, but they have the option to use Hangouts as well. Hangouts is just a little bit restricted in terms of um, the number of students you can connect with. 
So with Hangouts, you won't be able to connect with your entire class. Hangouts is, is, is quite a small group. It's either 10 or 15. Um, not, I can't remember exactly now, but it's a quite a small group that you can use, that you need to use Hangouts with. Meet is, of course, the G Suite version of it a, that allows a lot more. We're not going to go into grading now, but just so that you know where to find the setting, it is at the settings grading. So there's an overall grade calculation, et cetera, et cetera. This, the reason why we don't want to discuss this in detail now, is if you're not in a G Suite account, this doesn't really work, unfortunately. It, it does to a certain extent, but it becomes a lot more tricky to get it set up, the grading part of it, because it doesn't automatically grade quizzes and things like that. It does, it does grade, you can still do assignments, but you just won't be able to do quiz assignments. Right, so just so that we understand how these settings work, we're just going to save it and go back to our classroom. I see we've got some, some comments. So um, Bola and Justin have shown us how this part of it works. So I've posted one thing, and you'll see this is very similar to a social media kind of post. I've just posted a welcome to the classroom, and they can comment on this now. So they can add their comments. They just said, thanks, thanks, and we can reply to it. So I can say here, um, glad you made it home quickly. And then I can just send and reply to reply the message to her. Now, you'll see one of the things about this is there's only one reply tier. So it's not going to create a new little um, reply block for Justin specifically. However, we use this indicator to show that I'm specifically sending a message to her. Now, the stream is purely for communication. As I said, new messages will go to the top often. What in the past, what has often happened is people, um, Sean, there's only the register link, but I'll share that at the end quickly. Um, the only thing that you can, the, the, the oh, sorry, um, the thing about the stream that one has to keep in mind is if you post something now, it becomes quite difficult for learners to find again at a later stage. So when you're using the stream, I suggest use it for communication that is important to happen now, not to post homework and material. Homework, I suppose you could or you could add, but ask yourself always when you want to add something to Google Classroom, is it something that they will have to be able to find again in a few um, in a few days, weeks, months time, or is it something that they only need to access now as a once-off thing? If it's a now once-off thing, then the stream is perfect for that because it's purely a communication, a communication tool. Now, if I, um, if I just click on the share something with your class, it takes me to this dialog where I can now share whatever I want to share with my class. I can just enter a message. As per Google's way of doing things, they simplified it. They have not added lots of different ways to change your text, bold, underlined, etc., etc. It's just straightforward text, nothing more, nothing less. So. What we can say is, here's a useful um, website sorry, for personal development. And I can add things to it. So when I click on the, on the add icon, um, the default icon looks like the typical paper clip that we know for um, if we're going to have any attachments to an email, etc. But it gives you an option of four things, either something from Google Drive, you can add a link, a file, or a YouTube video. Now, Google Drive, straightforward. If you're going to click on Google Drive, it will open up a dialog where that navigates Google Drive. It'll show you the different tabs here at the top where you can find the recent, the recent files. So we can add this one, for example, as a useful resource. Um, we're going to insert that. You can use Upload, but Upload doesn't quite make sense if you're going to use this attach feature and then or you can just go to my drive and explore my drive share drive start anything like that so normal google drive navigation right so we're going to insert the g suite introduction as one option um let's say yes some useful resources rather because we're going to add a few years some useful resources for personal development so there i've added a slide but I can also add a link. Um, so we're going to say we'll add this one. Right now, if you add a link, what will happen is Google will go and find 
the website and give you a quick um, preview of the website, as you can see there. That's the Cape Wyland's um, e-learning platform. And the same way, you can also add YouTube videos. Now, if you go to YouTube, please note, you can either search here or you can find a URL. So um, let's say, I just quickly want to go um, find an example that we can use. So just give me, while that loads, um, something about finding something. So let's say, for example, we go and look for a video on Google Classroom. All right, we're going to search for videos in Google Classroom. One of, the, one of the problems here that you have to keep in mind is you can't actually preview the video from this, from this point. Um, so it'll only, you'll find a video, you can click on it, and you can add it. Once you've added it, you'll have to go preview it inside the um, You'll have to go you'll view the view the resource inside of um, Google Classroom itself. So for that reason, what I often feel works a little bit better um, is when we when we rather than doing it that way around. Um, okay, if you I can pause this, um, so. Rather than doing that way around, I suggest going on YouTube and finding the video that you're looking for. If you found the video that you want to use, you click on share, it'll bring up the dialog here where you just simply use that link. Rather use the link, rather go on YouTube first, find the video that you want to use, and copy the link. And then we go back to our classroom tab, or back to Google Classroom, and we paste it in, we paste it the URL there, and it will find the video, right? So we're going to add that. Google Classroom Basics. So there we there we have a few things that we want to add. Um, here's some useful resources for personal development, and now we post. But before we post, just two thing, two things regarding the posting that you should also um, take note of. If I've got multiple classrooms and I actually want to get this message out to multiple classrooms, I can click on this drop down here where. I'm using example classroom, but let's say for argument's sake, I want to send it to dummy class as well. Now it gives me the option to say, I'll send this exact same post to both classrooms. I don't need to change it around at all. If you notice carefully, what's happened now is this dropdown has now grayed, has now been grayed out. If I want to only share this with a number of people, so let's say for argument's sake, I decide I'm only going to share it with one or two students, remove all of them, and just select um, the first three students. What will now happen is they will see this post and no one else. So in this way, you can use this platform to, to send messages to different groups. You can't make a grouping within the, within the resource, unfortunately, but if there are specific things you want to send to specific learners, you can do it using Google Classroom in this way. Um, the top button if we click on that, it automatically selects all students. If I click on it again, it removes students. So we want to actually send this to all students. You can also, if you want to schedule it, let's say you set up a post now, but you don't really want to send it at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night, because remember, when you send this message and the learners are on your classroom, they will get a notification of this. Now, let's say you, you, you're working late, as unfortunately sometimes has to happen. You don't want to send it at 12, you're just going to schedule it to send it at 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, in this instance, we're just going to post it straight. So now it has been posted, and you'll see in your stream there's a, there's a number of things over here. Here's some useful resources for personal development. And all of it's on there, and they can access it. So what works quite nicely in this sense is if you're teaching, if, if there's something specific that you want your learners to access, um, let's say there's a specific video that you want them to watch before they get to class the next day. Now, we're talking about not necessarily only the application of Google Classroom in these times, but also, um, but also in for future use. So there's something you want them to go access before they get to Classroom. Then the stream is a good place to post it because it's something they will be immediately notified about and they can go access it before the next day. And it's easier to send it to them on this platform than another platform. Or, so, so, so keep that in mind. Now, the classwork section, which is a, which is the other very significant part of Google Classroom that is is slightly newer to it. Those of you who might have used Classroom in the past um, will not have seen this. So, it's a, I think they added it 
a little bit a little over a year ago or about a year roughly um, what's nice about classwork is within classwork you essentially create your folders where people access the access content in your classroom one thing I want to warn you about class drive folder for now the best thing to understand is don't really go in there and use that class drive folder is essentially learners will see this as well but the link to class drive folder is a link to a folder that is unique to each student it's basically their little place where they can keep work that's related to your classroom but you don't you don't actually have access to it and they don't have access to your class drive folder so everyone has their own folder which is their own folder and isn't shared with everyone so and i know people have made this mistake in the past by putting resources in that folder and thinking that this is then obviously accessible to the learners that's not the way that it works so in 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 the classwork section when we create something we first need to create topics and in those topics we're going to create resources so our first topic that we can create for example i'm an english teacher so i tend to use examples from english we'll add a topic called poetry right now i'm adding my poetry topic you'll see it automatically creates a little navigation here to the right um, as I add more topics, more topics will appear and you'll, and you'll see a longer list of topics over there. Try and think carefully about how you organize your content because at the end of the day, the key thing is to make it easy for learners to access the right content. Now that I've created a topic, a topic is basically like a folder that I'm going to create. Within this topic, I can now create different, um, different little tools. So if I click on material, um, what happens is it takes me to the little box where I need to add my material. Now, very, very seldom are you going to have material just be something that you type out. Um, we're going to say, uh, let's just call it example material. And for the most part, what, what you will end up doing is you'll end up using things that you've either got things on your computer already, if you want to upload a PDF or a PowerPoint or whatever, or ideally, you're going to add things from Google Drive. So let's say add Google Drive. Now we're going to go and find um, that's something that's recent that we can add. Let's just add. Uh, okay, I'm just going to add this this one for argument's sake. Okay, so let's insert the Quizlet presentation. This is Quizlet is a tool we did training on yesterday. Very useful um, tool. So what happens now is I've added a slide to this presentation oh, yes, a slide to to this to the material here just be careful because by default what we often want to do then after this is just go and click on post immediately first assign a topic to it so you can either create new topics within the posting of materials so you don't really need to go and create topics before and i've always just found it works nicer that way we're going to create it in poetry and we're going to post i know this has nothing to do with poetry but just as an example and again, we've got the option to post it to multiple classes, and we've got the option to post to individual students if you don't want it to be accessible for everyone. So we're just going to post it. Now you'll see when we've got poetry, now we've got a little tab over there that calls itself example material. If I click on it, it shows me the resources that I can find within that. Now, what's nice about this is you can add multiple resources to this. The way that I used this in the past, just to give an idea, I created a poetry. Um, I created a poetry topic, and then I had term one poetry, term two poetry, term four poetry, or three poetry as material resources under this. So you would click on term one poetry, and it'll give you all the resources on term one's poetry. Same for term two poetry, all the resources on term two poetry. So it's easy to navigate it to find the resources that you're looking for. What is very useful is if this is not your first classroom and you've been using this for a while, we can click on the reuse post option. Now reuse post takes me to my different classrooms where we can select the class. Let's say we're going to select the webinar class and I'm going to show you an example of what we refer to. So this is now term two, reuse. I'm going to reuse this exact same um, material it brings me first to the material or to the create material dialog and here we go 
everything is in there. It's already in the poetry section as I wanted it to be. All of it is there. I can just post and send it again. Right. So now I've got two sections in here. I've got term two and I've got term uh, and I've got the example material. Now, I spoke about earlier when we went to the settings about the fact that classwork notifications go to stream. So if I click on stream now, you'll see there's just notifications over there. If I click on it, it'll take me to the actual um, to the actual resource. So if you'd like to have it this way, it is, an, it is a quick, easy way to navigate. I don't suggest adding the full view. This one works nicely, but this is effectively a link to that classwork. So we click on it and it takes me to the classwork. Click on it and it takes me to the classwork. Very quick and easy way to navigate to your resources. Now the nice thing about this is when adding it to classwork, it will be organized in a way that is very easy to access at a later stage. And I think that is one of the most important things to realize about this. The idea is to build resources that remain accessible to learners at a later stage as well. And not only something that is that is accessible in the year and the now. Right. So we've looked at the stream. We've looked at classwork. But now we still need to look at how do I get content from my learners? We've only looked at it. Remember, we said it's a distribution platform where I get can get my content to the learners. Now, at this point, I just want to pause quickly because I said I'm going to allow op opportunity to ask questions, and I realize I haven't given you any time to ask questions. Are there any questions specifically? I, I know there has, has, hasn't been any questions in the chat, but are there any questions that you want to ask at this point? Just give me a thumbs up if you're happy for me to continue. Then I know that you're all still with me. Thank you, Lindy. I see you've given me a thumbs up in the video. All right. Linda, Peter. Okay. So everything still makes sense so far? Great stuff. Now, when we want to get resources from our learners, this is often the point where it can become a little bit more tricky and becomes definitely becomes a lot more challenging in these in the, the situation that we find ourselves in where we don't have ne necessarily a face to face contact with our learners because it's a, it's a system where that they struggle with a little bit so i strongly suggest before you try and do any kind of formal assessment formal type of content that you're getting from them just get them to do something simple and straightforward like completing a um, or just filling out the document for you or just taking a photo of themselves and sending that in. Something very straightforward that they can just get used to how the process works. If you're going to dive into it straight up and say, we're going to do a, an essay that you have to write, I'm going to mark it and this is going to count for marks, I promise you, you will run into, um, into a lot of headaches doing this. So first test it out. Now, the basic way to do it, you're going to have to go to Classwork. The option isn't available at Stream. Is you're going to create an assignment. The easiest and the most straightforward way of getting information from your learners is using the Create Question option. So this might be a good place to start. Let's just first use the Question option. So what Question does is you literally ask them a question. So we can ask a question, how are you all doing? And my instructions is, um, I've missed everyone so much in these times. Please check in and tell me how you are doing at home or whatever the case. Maybe they're not at home anymore. Maybe they have returned. So please check in and tell me how you're doing at home. If we want to, we can ask it just like that, as, a, as an easy way of, of kind of getting the ball rolling. Now, all assignments have these basic elements added to it. Some of them have a few more, some of them have a few slightly different things. But essentially, you can assign marks to it. You can also make it ungraded. So if it's just a question like this, we're not going to actually award them marks on telling me how they are. But you could, for argument's sake, give it a mark out of 10. I'm going to make it a mark out of 10. Because I'm going to ask this question now on Google 
classroom. Well, let's make it something that is topical to what we are doing. Um, are you using Google Classroom yet? Yes, so that's going to be our question. Um, tell me more about how you've been using Google Classroom. If you haven't, then how? Well, let's, just, let's just leave it like that. Right, so we're going to ask this question. I'm going to give you a minute or two to actually reply to this question. But we can also give a due date. So let's say the due date is going to be today. And we can add a time to it. Oh, sorry, that's tomorrow. Make it today. And we're going to give a time to it. We're going to make it at 4. Right. So it is due at 4 o'clock today. And we assign a topic to it. We're going to create a new topic called random questions. And this part is quite an important and, and, and interesting um, element to using Google Classroom. The students can reply to each other button. Now, if you really get your students going on Google Classroom, some of, them, some of the greatest impact that I've seen in the past when I used Google Classroom was specifically this, students reply to each other. But it can go horribly wrong as well, just to warn you, because sometimes they use it in a wonderful way and they give constructive feedback to each other. Other times it's just nonsense. So again, it's one of those things that maybe first get them used to the platform, sensitize them to how it works, and then you can start asking questions with that. But for this instance, we're going to leave it on. We're going to assume that you're all used to this. We can add a multiple choice question if we wanted to, or we can just give them a short answer. So same with other things. You can schedule it. You can have it a draft, or we can ask the question. I'm going to ask it now. And this is our first example of how we can actually get resources or get things from our learners. Now, I want you to have a quick look on your Google Classroom. So now you need to switch again to, your, to the Classroom tab that I hope you still have open and have a look at what we find, find there now. You should find that Jakob Vernicke have posted a new question. And if you click on it, it allows you to answer the question. All right, so I'm going to give you a minute or two to try and do that, to answer these questions. And while, while you're doing that, I'm going to just quickly get my set up. I'm just going to quickly join the, the classroom as well so that I can show you what it looks like when joining on a mobile device. Right, are you managing to answer that question? Just to show you from a teacher side of things, I see four people have already turned in, four people have already answered the question. Right, just to show you quickly what it looks like on a mobile device, we're not going to spend too much time here. Um, so on a mobile device, what now happens is if I join my classroom, this is now just my stream that I see first up. At the bottom, I can click on classwork, and it'll show me the classwork that I have or that, that's been posted to this classroom. What's also very nice is... If I go to the option setting, um, which you don't, oh, there we go, there you see it now. If we click on the to do, it'll bring up the assignments that I actually have to complete. Now, these things, in the, these other examples are just part of the dummy class when I test things out, but you'll see there's a thing that tells me due today. 
Now you can imagine what works incredibly well is if these learners have multiple Google Classroom set up for different subjects, then they will have, if they go to to do, they'll see all the different things that are actually have to be done. So this is essentially a very easy way for them to know what homework needs to be completed, what things they need to engage with. So if we go back here um, to our material, it's again, it's a straightforward way. If I click on a material, it takes me to the resources that I have over there. If I click on the other material, it will take me to those resources. And I scroll down and I'll see here some useful resources for personal development. If I click on it, it shows me the resources. So as you can see, from a mobile device perspective, it's a very clean and easy way to interact with um, with, with the resources. And it's what, what's specifically nice about using something like this, rather than just using a WhatsApp or, or a platform like that for communication, is the learners find it very easy to access work, to find resources that have been done. So answering a question. So when I have a question, the answers actually appear as class comments, which is quite nice to, it's a very straightforward way of doing it. But the difference is obviously it's an assignment. So they know there's a time that's attached to it. They see it in their to-do list. So you can ask normal questions anywhere in your stream. But what's nice is, as I said, this appears specifically as something that has to happen. Now, in terms of answering it, if I click on the, up, um, on the, um, the question, the, the, the question specifically, it just takes me to this little screen where I need to reply and, and give my answer. Yes, I've used it it often before. Works great. Okay, so there I go and I hand in and I submit my answer. Right, I can't make changes to the answers. I can't do anything. Um, I, I can't actually add anything to it. What's quite cool about this is I can also now see my class, see the class, my, the, the, the answers of the others in the classroom. And I can reply to them, et cetera, et cetera, if I wanted to. So they've changed the question thing around a little bit. I used to use it quite differently than, than um, you have on you now. But I think this is probably the easiest and the quickest way to start interacting with your learners on a platform like this, right? And it works, it, it, it's a very straightforward an easy to navigate resource. And what's also um, a great benefit of using this, if you've got the app on your phone, the app will do the heavy lifting um, in terms of data usage on the device. And you're not going to have a lot of data that's trickling through to it. So it becomes a lot lighter in terms of resource usage. And why we want to encourage the idea of using the Google apps Something like a Google Doc uses a lot less data than, um, than, for example, a PDF. A Google Slide uses a lot less data than a PowerPoint. So if data is a concern, which I think it is for almost all of us, how do we minimize the use of data? Then um, that is something that you can keep in mind. Using the Google Apps will minimize data usage significantly compared to compared to alternative tools. Right, so just to get us back onto, um, onto this present, onto this side of things. So from the teacher, what I have now is I've got 11 students who've turned in their assignments. Now, if I want to see what they did, the assignments looks very similar to this. The only difference is if I click on a name, I will now get an icon of the document that they've submitted with that. Assignments are usually based on documents that they submit. So yes, I have, then I can just reply to this and say, great, glad you've used it. Now you'll see there's a difference between the, um, between the reply and the private comment because the reply for a question is something that's public and the rest of the class will also see it. But if I want to add a private comment, um, I've not used Google Classroom yet, so now we can add a private comment. I hope this session helps you to get going. Now, the difference is Kim Lee will see this message, but the rest of the class will not see this message. So the difference between the two. And they will be able to access these messages um, on their side of things, just to, just to see the messages that I've sent to them. Now, 
when I'm happy, if I want to, in this instance, I've already looked at these two things, so I can actually give them a mark. So I'm going to give Wesley because he has used it. I'm going to give him 10. Yaku, yes. sorry to disturb. Just put your screen in the middle, please. It's 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 the other one that's in the middle now. Okay, if you, you're not seeing, which other one are you seeing now? I'm not seeing. I'm not seeing the presentation itself. It is the screen that you are presenting. Okay, sorry. There we go. Right? Is it? Can you see the presentation now again? I can see it, yes. If you could just repeat the other steps, I don't know how much would be followed by the other people in the meeting, in the, in the training. Okay, right. Sorry. Sorry, sometimes it gets a little bit confused when you switch between the mobile presentation and the desktop presentation. So just to show the difference between the two, let's go have a look at um, Christelle's one. There are two sections that we spoke about. There's the private comment that you can give and then the public comment that you can give. So um, yeah, at the top, when you click right under the thing, you'll see I can reply here. This is something everyone will see. At the bottom, there's a private comment. Now, anything that I've done, I can now mark. So, Kim Lee, please do not take this the wrong way because I've not used Google Classroom yet, so we're going to give her a 1 out of 10. At least she's honest, so let's make it a 10. Um, so, both of these, we're going to make, we, we are going to give 10 out of 10, and I can now return these marks by selecting these two and returning it. Now, again, I'm just going to stress this because I, I said it before we started looking at this. When we get to the, and there Kim Lee's also responded to this. Now, just take note, when we get to the part where learners are going to hand in content, where you're getting things from them, Google Classroom becomes a little bit more complicated. So I strongly suggest that you start exploring the other part first, the part where you get your content onto the classroom Get your learners onto the classroom before you go into too much detail with this part of Google Classroom because this part is the slightly more complicated part. So there are other things that we can do. I'm not going to go into detail on those now. I will share links to other videos that you can go watch where we look at the more advanced features of Google Classroom, such as adding the quiz assignments, adding the normal assignments, et cetera, et cetera, how they hand in additional work. But I'm not a fan of information overload, so we're going to stop there in terms of um, the function, the, 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 the handing in of things. Now, what you'll see here is if we click on the, um, on the, the class comments, there's a, there's a couple of comments that, that we have here already from the people who have answered the questions. Um, the last thing that is quite that is, that is a useful thing is if we click on grades, It'll show us the different assignments and the marks that have been achieved. So there's a there's an average of, or the class average is ten because I've only marked two of them yet. You'll see some of these don't have a mark at all. They don't, don't display any kind of mark yet. It's just an indication that it hasn't been handed in yet. So a couple of these people still haven't handed in their assignments. So we're obviously going to give them time to do that. You can also delve into individual learners. So let's say, for example, we're going to go into Wesley specifically. Now we can click on him, and it'll show us all the different assignments that they have done. Again, this is the more complicated part of Google Classroom. For now, we're going to steer clear of that. We just want to get our learners onto it and get classwork on, onto this platform. One little trick that I want to show you, because I think it is a... It, it's a useful element to have or useful thing to, to understand about um, a classroom. If we click on classwork, you'll see there's an option here that opens up Google Calendar. Now, if you're going to go to Google Calendar, it'll just simply open up a normal Google Calendar. So this is my Google Calendar. There's not a lot on it at the moment. Um, now, if I'm going to... I'm just going to zoom in quite a bit here. Let's, um, let's just have a look at only at the week view. Right. So you'll notice here on Google on Google Calendar, these are the training sessions that we've had. I've got a new little event over there in blue under this session, and that is the question, are you using Google Classroom yet? Now, if you have joined my classroom and you go to your Google Calendar, you will see the same little 
um, the same little notification over there because it gets added to your calendar so that you can get notifications about it. If you want to set up a, a, um, a certain event or a calendar thing with your learners, so for example, you're going to say at one o'clock on Friday, they are going to be writing a test. So let's call this class test. Um, now when we add guests, this is one of the, the, um, the very useful features that happens. When you create a classroom, the members of the classroom are automatically added into what we call a Google group. Now you can use that group in Drive when you're sharing files and sharing folders and whatever the case is that you're doing that. But when you're creating calendar events, you can also use that Google, that group. So if I say add guests and I enter example classroom, this allows me to pick the class, the, 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 people in this classroom to automatically be invited to the session. So I can set up events in, in Google Calendar so that they are made aware of when they are going to be writing tests and they will get notifications, etc., etc. So if I'm going to click just the classroom, select the classroom, we can send it like that. I tend to prefer, just so you understand the difference, um, sorry, just so you understand the difference between the two, um, Okay, just ignore that. That is something entirely different. The difference between these icons, the top one is, is the icon for a group. Now, we actually want to just invite the individuals. It doesn't really make much of a difference. I just tend to prefer using this because if I click on that, what I'll be able to see is all the individual names of the people who have joined my classroom. Very quick and easy way to invite people to events. You can also, if you prefer to only invite the teachers, I'm going to, that, that's something I realize now I neglected to talk about. We'll look at that now. Um, you can do that as well. So if I have this, I've set up a time, I can do all of that. This class, I can save this class test and they will now be, they will now get notifications. I can add attachments. I can add various things like you would normally go about setting up a Google, um, any Google event. Now I don't want to do this because I don't want to necessarily invite you to this event. So I'm just going to discard this, but just so that you understand how the calendar side of things work. A very useful tool once your learners start really getting into Google Classroom, um, then they'll be able to really they'll, they'll they'll really be able to, or you'll be able to set times and they'll know what is happening when. Um, always a very a very nice feature in addition to um, to be able to get get those dates and times through to your learners as well. Now, the one thing that I realized that we didn't look at, if we go back to people, you see you'll have, you actually have the option to add teachers to a classroom as well. Now, I, I often like to use this, this way of going about things where you, if, if let's say for argument's sake, You've got three English classes. One person does the majority of the, the planning and the preparation of materials. The other two are also part of the teaching group. Then it's, it's always nice to have individual classrooms set up with a person who does the majority of the planning as a teacher on all of those classes. So when content is shared, they can ensure that they share the same content on all three classes. But when content is collected, it is still individual to that classroom, if it makes sense. Um, it depends entirely on how your school setup works, how you how you um, can adapt this. But another feature that's quite nice, for example, is if everything moves onto Google Classroom, you can add the subject advisors as a as a teacher, and then they can have easy access to the classroom for moderation purposes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, which which again is the kind of way that we are moving towards in the future to a more digital based um, environment. So with that said, we're going to, I think, I think there's a, there's a lot of information that's already um, we've gone through. So I'm going to summarize for us quickly what we do when we want to get going with Google Classroom. So first things first, your main home screen with Google Class in Google Classroom is you first go and create your, your, your class, right? So click on Create Class. 
Then once you've created your classroom, what I strongly suggest, the settings that works well for, for the first time we're going to have the classroom set up is to make sure that your students can't post, they can only comment because they're not likely to say, um, to, to have lots of um, silly comments on content that the teacher has posted. So I suggest doing it like that, just making that one setting, changing it one setting. Then, once you've got that set up, what I think works well is to first populate it with some classwork before you get your learners on board. Go and have a look at some of the work that you are currently busy with that you want to get on there, or alternatively, alternatively have a look at work that you have completed that will be essential for them to review. So if, for example, you're a matric teacher, it's a great idea to get a lot of resources on there that you can get your learners to go on to and do revision and start going through work that they might have missed or might need to, to get reinforced on. And once you've got some classwork, and I'm not talking about the entire year's curriculum, I'm just talking about having something on there and not necessarily questions and quizzes and assignments and things like that, just resources that they can access. Once that is on classwork, then you start getting your learners to join your classroom. And the easiest way to do that is tell them they need to install the Google Classroom app on their phone. In all likelihood, they already, well, if they're using an Android phone, which a lot of them are, they will have a Google account already. They might not know what their own Google account is, but they must have a Google account in order to access um, Play Store. So they'll have something set up there. Once they've installed Google Classroom, then you, t then you send them the code. Now, how you send them the code, it depends entirely, not this code, obviously, the code that is generated by your classroom, because I'm going to lock this classroom after this session. Um, so whatever code is generated by your classroom, you send them the code. This is the code that they use to join. And then you start going through the process of getting them to join the classroom. Very often, when you use Google Classroom the first time, you're going to have to use it in conjunction with a different communication tool. So obviously the easiest is a face-to-face -face thing where they're in our classrooms and we can tell them face-to-face, -face, um, download the app, join my classroom, et cetera, et cetera. But we have to obviously keep in mind that that's not always a possibility at the moment. So however you can get this code to them that they can start joining your classrooms. Once that happens, the whole process of starting to learn how, starting to learn how you can use this will start happening naturally. As I said, I will send you a few links to a few videos that you can go into more advanced features. But I think for now, if you can just get that, start your classroom, load some content, get your learners on board, then you are on the right path to implementing Google Classroom effectively. And the last thing to also keep in mind um, is the whole platform works so much better on a when we're using all of the elements to it, right? Um, so finally, in terms of of Google Classroom, it works perfectly fine on an iPhone. It works. Um, there's nothing. There's no issues with it. The only difference between an iPhone and an Android phone is iPhones don't always have Google accounts set up on them already. So all Android phones will have them set up by default because they need to use Google Play Store, but an iPhone might not have an account like that at all. 